So you say you want to learn how to hunt elk. Well, welcome back to part two of our Basics to Becoming an Elk Hunter series. Look, if you're looking to hunt elk for the first time, or even if you've hunted elk and you've been feeling overwhelmed with all the information that's out there, the goal of this series is to keep it as simple as possible. From where to hunt, our camping gear, scouting and calling basics, your tactics on closing and shot placements and success basics, all simplified. So my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by elkgrows.com, with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and elk hunting coach, Joe Gilly. You want to hunt elk? They live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello there, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And as always, for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, Pull up a chair and welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of your show, coming to you from Spring, Texas, and joining me tonight's crew. It is absolutely on fire and epic. We have got one of our awesome Elk Bros hunting coaches with us. We've got the Gila runner, Mr. Eric Aragon. We have our <laughs> world championship, no doubt, world championship caller in-house, Mr. Travis O'Shea, our brother from up north in Canada. And that's right, we got one of our newest coaches in the house with us, the kid out of the DFW area, Mr. Cody Kirkpatrick. And always, <laughs> as always, we've got the ninja from Cimarron, New Mexico. We've got the ninja, Leroy Chavez, and WWJGD is always in the house. What would Joe Gillia do? What's going on, fellas? <laughs> What's up, Big O? Hey, boys. Hey, Big O. What's happening? Man, we got it teed up tonight. It's going to be a solid show, just like it was last time, right, Joe? Yes, sir, man. And breaking some folks in this time, man. We have the kid with us tonight, man. Yes, I'm just so excited about that. You know, and so this runs right into something, and it'll be able to segue us over. But for people that don't remember or don't know, Cody, the kid Kirkpatrick right here was our 2022 hunt with the elk bros giveaway winner last Absolutely. year. So this guy's already been through it with us. And, and that's, what's so amazing is, you know, as we build this out, we all got a chance to hunt with Cody and uh, we would come back to camp. And everybody was like, God, I don't know about that guy, man. <laughs> Dude made cardinal sin on day one. <laughs> no, I mean, he kicked all our asses if he'd have turned that arrow loose. <laughs> well, let me say, you know, Cody was um, fit in like a glove, Definitely. Um, passionate, hard worker. Uh, I'm only come from good stuff, raisin, but... Joe. Come from good raisin. His dad was with him. Yeah, dad was with him. Come from good raisin, brother. <clears throat> Actually, I think it was Kev that was the one that was the good one in the camp, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's a hell of a storyteller. If you guys think I can tell a story, you ain't nobody like Mr. Kirkpatrick. They call that fine breeding. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> it, no. What we call it in Texas is selected breeding. <laughs> uh, after after about the seventh day, um, and Cody was actually with me on the day that I killed my bull on day ten of the hunt. Actually, yep. right? yeah. it was a ten. Yeah, day, he but... already faced some serious adversity, huh, Joe? Yeah, yeah, sure did. Yeah, he went out there, trashed his knee, ended up going to the hospital. And yeah. put a brace on that thing, man, and just got after it for the rest dude, of the Dude, we do came back with a torn up knee and still went went elk hunting. I'm like, that dude can ride the river with us. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, that was the thing was um it was about day eight. And uh and I was just talking with Cody and I was like, Man, you could just tell how much he's put into this. And I mean, 
you know, it, it's just mm -hmm. like Eric here, yeah. man. It's just like, um, you know, uh, we've got Cole and, and Guy, all these guys that are have been coming in with us. You know, you got Travis here. You know, Travis is our northern brother from another mother, man. I mean, he's been doing this. And, you know, th this is a guy that's been at the – World Calling Championships, placed third over there. This guy produces his own calls. And he's been, you know, knocking them down up there. But that's that's only part of it, right? For me, our coaching staff is about people that have something that you're not able to teach, and that's passion. You know, that's, that's something that you're not able to teach. That has to be innate. And, you know, I started mentioning to Cody, I mean, because I started to really appreciate this guy, man. And I was like, I don't know how you feel about it, bud, but, man, I'm really thinking about if you're willing, I'd like to start see you working and training to be one of our coaches. And uh, oh, we hemmed and hawed and... <laughs> Maybe a, tear, maybe a tear in the eye. I don't know. <laughs> maybe a what? A tear in the eye. Yeah. Maybe a tear in the eye, he said. Yeah. You know, but, uh, hey, has, has he had to sleep with Manano yet in the horse trailer? <laughs> <laughs> then you'll know. Then you'll know. That's, that's the new test, man. That's where we're going to find out how O'Shea is, man, when we get up there to camp, man. And he's got to be yeah. around the wall. He's got to exactly. around, be around the mafia. Yeah. yeah, and me snoring. But, That's okay. Uh, <laughs> I can hang with the best of them. <laughs> but Cody, you know, tell us about your experience and and this segue into being a coach for you, man. Um, I can tell you, you know, like like I've always I've always said, I, I, this is my passion. This is what I want to do. This is what I love to do. Um, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about, you know, what am I doing next fall? I mean, it bugs me to death if I don't have a plan. Y'all know that from uh, how many times I pack my truck every year. So, um, <laughs> but no, honestly, um, it, it, it's an honor to, uh, to, to be around you guys and, and to learn from you guys. And, uh, you know, when I came to camp with it, we came to camp last year, it was just be a sponge, just learn, watch. Um, you know, uh, I believe that you learn a lot just from watching people's actions, you know, just follow, you know, following you, Joe Gill, you know, following and watching. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a hunter at heart um, and I've hunted all my life, but uh, you know, these, uh, these, these elk are, they're a different critter. And uh, uh, a lot different than than your your flat landing and uh, sitting in a stand hunting whitetails. Yeah. Um, you, you've got to get after it. You've got to be passionate, um, and you you you've got to want it. And um, I I think that uh, the the people that 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 put in the the time learning you know about the animal, learning all of the all of the things that you guys taught me through the coaching sessions, um, and and then applying those. Um, I, I, I truly believe that, uh, that, that those have, have they, they've, they steepened my learning curve where I, I'm, I'm nowhere near where I would have been without y'all's help. So, um, I appreciate that and appreciate you guys time, uh, that you guys have put into, in, in, into me. So, well, and that was the thing that I saw, man, was, um, how much you had come along and how much you were a sponge and how much you picked up, applied and um, followed and believed our philosophy. You understand our playbook. Um, your calling is, is tremendous. You know, you keep working on all your skill sets and that's what we're, what, what we want. That's what we want to be able to teach other people. So um, welcome aboard, dude. Yeah, <laughs> so, I'm, ex I'm excited. Let's go to the fold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like I tell everybody, man, too much is given much is required. So yeah. uh, at the end of the day, we, you know, with these guys all play hard. We love hard and we, we run and play hard. But at the end of the day, man, it's all about spreading what we love, which is elk hunting, man. Um, I will, you know, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life, you know, some way, shape or form for sure. So, right. and we're going to make that, that a reality. So, and and speaking uh, of man, the hunt with the elk bros giveaway, um, yeah. 
you know, this comes out, when this comes out, I think we're only about a week away from the giveaway starting. The giveaway yeah. is going to start on March 6th and 16th. I'm sorry, March 16th, 16th and run through May 9th. Um, a winner going to be hunting with the Elk Bros in camp with us as well <laughs> as uh, our <clears throat> coach group that will be there. But there is something even... <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable, man. Steve Harrell over at uh, Drifter Trailers, man. Our our buddy Steve and Drifter Trailers is partnering with the Elk Bros. And he has done something that is just unbelievable. He is including in the giveaway, he's including this Overland Camper Trailer. If you, you can't see it wow. on the podcast, but if you want to uh, go to our Elk Bros YouTube channel and take a look at this booger, it's a five by eight Overland Camper. Um, it's got, <laughs> it's, it's the coolest thing you'd ever seen. And he is actually bringing that to Elk Camp for the winner of the hunt to have at camp and drive home from there. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to use an alias. I'm going (laughs) to, I'm going to, I'm going to sign up as, I'm going to sign up as Fernando Valenzuela, man. I had 24 (laughs) wins. The Healer Ridge Runners take it. I'm taking that home. Oh man. It is the coolest thing. And, And that's not it too. This year, we've got some other people that are working on other prize packages yes. besides the grand prize. So yes. there's a lot of things that come with that grand prize. I mean, they're going to get coaching. They're going to be the camp with us. They're going to get our academy. You know, they're going to get this booger right here. And uh, they're going to have I'm actually a discount for some new camo that is about to come out that we're going to be hooking into as well. So pretty cool unbelievable. stuff. Unbelievable. Yeah, and and I'm working with some local bow shops here that are, you know, we're trying to get a bow, man. So yep. at the end of the day, uh, there's a lot of things that we're working on on the backside, and um, you know, we might be able to convince Luis to build us some really n- nice pills mm-hmm. for him as well. So uh, <laughs> you know, it'd be cool. I've been I've been banging on that monkey a little bit, and we'll see what happens out of it, what we get out of it. Yeah, I, I would. <laughs> I would really like to have multiple bows for, you know, other people in this giveaway, because in order for people to enter, there's going to be a whole deal that they've got to do. But basically an entry is going to be purchasing our Academy gives you one entry. Um, The Academy at that point in time is actually going to go for its full price. Um, the, The prize package for this grand prize is over twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven thousand dollars. Yeah. So wow. um, it's tremendous wow. opportunity. So, That's a lot. Bust the hunt. Yeah. They're, they're going to get. They're going to get a yeah. uh, an entry for you know either getting our um, our academy or purchasing it for somebody else. Or also they're going to get it after they do that, they'll get additional entries for every $50 spent in our store. And, uh, and they're going to have to do things like they're going to have to follow drifter trailers and things like that as well. But that'll all come out here um, in a, in a week or so, everybody will see that we are so excited about, you know, the most exciting part about it is really honestly being able to meet somebody like the kid there, man. Yeah, man. I mean, met mm-hmm. Cody in camp and his dad was amazing man yep yep you got both barrels that's for sure 100 (laughs) wouldn't have took it any other way either man it was a great camp we had a great camp good food uh everybody pitched in and we had a cook there that was phenomenal man he took good care of us every day and um so yeah it was a great hunt and 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 it was a tough hunt but it was a great hunt yep Absolutely. And uh, it's it's hard to go wrong like that. And to to remind those winners, they also, the winner of that, just like Cody did, gets to bring another person along for the education. So yeah. um, the goal is to have their partner. We're trying to make a DIY hunter. So that's the, the goal of this so that they're yeah. confident and they have a skill set and they have a partner that they can work with. You know, Joe, I say it was a, you know, I kind of misspoke. I said it was a tough hunt. It really wasn't. It we were just inches away from it mm-hmm. being unfreaking believable <laughs> off the chain hunt. I mean, yeah, one so step many, away. I'm telling you, so <laughs> many guys, myself included, biggest bull I ever seen in my life, right? I needed three feet and he's done, you know. Uh right. at 12 yards, you know. Yep. Uh 
R.C. Knox just inches away from getting it done. Um, just so many of us had, you know, in Luis, Luis never misses, right? He misses a pull, which Joe says, by God, that was God's inter, that was divine intervention that God knocked that arrow down, right? Because uh, it would have been four or five days of us getting him out of there. But at the end of the day, like I said, I say that with all due respect because it wasn't wasn't that tough. It was just Man, we were so close so many times. Uh, don't know that I've ever been so close without making it happen. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. And I and I passed. Definitely. Yeah. Did. Yep. On Ratchet Ridge. Yep. Did <laughs> patch, passed on Ratchet Ridge. Ratchet Ridge. Uh, you know, I actually got to hunt with just an awesome gentleman, uh, Mr. Larry. And man, I'm telling you, he had a couple opportunities with me too, and just seconds away from getting it done. And then to be able to seal it up with Tom Roth was just, you know, the coup de grace for us. And um, I mean, anytime you can help a guy get his first bull, it's uh, it's better than your own first bull, you know, um, for me anyway. It was just cool. So whoever you guys out there and. In grinder land, man, y'all get your money together and let's get this done because we can't wait to see you in camp here in September. Let's start rocking this thing on. We got some people I know that are wanting to hear some elk stuff, so let's go to our Elk Bros mailbox. Absolutely. Right. Oh, I'm going to kick this off, and uh, we got a question from Craig Sauer from Spokane, Washington. So, Craig, thanks for listening to the show, submitting the great question. Um, but your question is this. It says, what if you're a solo hunter – during the week of the season when it's often in the low to mid fifties and the highs are in the upper eighties, even sometimes in the nineties, can you successfully pack out and care for the meat in those hot temps with a normal pack out? My definition of normal would be no more than 1.5 miles of walking pack out one way, et cetera, and the ability to hang quarters in the shade of trees and in game bags. So um, yeah, you can absolutely do that. So uh, last year, just to give you an example, uh, my partner and I killed two elk in 10 minutes and we we're packed in the wilderness. And we spent uh, each haul out was over three miles each direction. So, I mean, we spent 22 hours uh, hauling meat and hot, hot temperatures. But I think some of the keys, sorry about my dogs barking. I think some of the, the yeah, sorry about that. They are meat and they're hungry. <laughs> um, you know, distance and, and, and heat, weather, the time you're going to, you kill the animal. I mean, we ended up killing them seven o'clock in the morning early. Um, but for us, I think the main thing, cause I was concerned about heat and getting too far out. But, um, one thing I would say is I debone the animal. I don't like keeping it on the bone. Obviously I'm hauling out on my back. I don't have horses. So I'm cutting weight, but it cools that meat a lot faster. So it's getting that animal broken down, getting it in those game bags, and then getting, getting it, it in hung shade. up, and getting it in the shade. Yeah, and it'll it'll do well. Yeah. So we didn't, you know, there was no spoilage in our part. And again, it was like, you know, each trip was six miles. Um, I've gone farther than that. I've gone like eight to ten at times, and uh, <clears throat> it's just, you know, one. It, if I killed it late in the evening, I really like that better because then I can let it just catch that air all night. It gets cooler right. and temps. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just you know breaking it down, making sure that meat's clean. You know the way you process and handle it. But yeah, it's um, even when temps are in that eighty degree, ninety degree mark. If you get it in the shade, it's twenty five, thirty degrees cooler absolutely. in the shade. Mm -hmm. man. Yeah, all right. So it's super important to get it like like Mister. Uh, Eric said is to get it off the bone. That bone creates, it holds a lot of heat and that's where you'll get spoilage from. You get it off that bone and then some cheesecloth or a good game bag and get it hung in the shade or down in the shade, man, you know, and even if you're around a creek bed that's got some water running, you know, around it, those rocks are cooler and stuff like that. You can get it in some shade. Uh, it's going to last a lot longer. And I would say yep. really, um, 
because there is a fine line about getting it off the bone and then throw it in a bag with all the meat together if it's warm. You got to kind of be careful of that. Yeah. Um, but I think mm-hmm. the most important thing is is to get it off the body, man. Get it yeah. away from that belly. Mm-hmm. Get it away from that chest, because we even have a and we're going to talk about this in our basics later. But you know, we even have a way that we take things off where we actually keep the skin on on these mm-hmm. critters. Um, mm-hmm. But our pack out. You know, we pack out in groups a lot of times, so things are going to be quick and we're going to get it to camp pretty quick and it helps us to keep it clean. But there's always the biggest part of that where that bone's exposed and the largest part of those meat and that muscle system is exposed when you take off a shoulder or when you take off that ham that lets that cool down right away as long as you hang that for a little bit off in there and in the shade. And once it gets in the shade and gets air around it, that air hitting that that wetness gives it a coolness yeah. on there as well. So yeah. we want to keep that. you a little bit of power cord with, you know, paracord with you. Yeah. So you all, all the time. Yeah. yeah. But, but the other thing is, is be careful of listening to Eric. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I that three miles is. is no big deal for him. Yeah, baby. Man. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you this, oh, this is a, man. Yeah. If you've never met Eric, he's an extreme. I mean, this guy does these these long walks, man. What what's the name of the the walk that you guys do? The baton, oh, baton death march. Yeah, death march. Yeah. You know, so many miles, and yeah. um, this guy's in incredible shape. Um, had a guy with him that was in real good shape, and if you've never had to pack out an animal, you know, three miles it, by yourself. Now, <sighs> as a pair. That's a whole different story. No but if you ever had to do it by yourself, it can be daunting. And I'll, yeah. and I'll tell you this. If any of you are in the area around Bailey, Colorado, or if you're around um, northern New Mexico, there's a competition coming here that is <clears throat> called the Western Hunt Fest. And they have a pack-out challenge. And that pack-out challenge is only a mile and a half where you have to actually get out animal horns and your gear um, in a timed event on that. And just to let you feel and really get a measure, a baseline of what that is. Now, can it be done? Absolutely. You know, when Eric says a mile and a half, when you say mile and a half of walking pack out, absolutely, man. Piece of cake. I mean, Chav, have, well, I don't. I won't say piece of cake, but Chav and I have done that with meat <laughs> over our shoulders, you know, in the early days. But once you start getting three miles out and you're by yourself, then you have to utilize some other things to be able to do that. Yes, you can do it when those temps get high because, again, you can find shades. You can find lower areas. You can do things like that. So, um, you know, travel up north up there. I mean, I thought, you know, when I was talking to people about Canada, I was like, oh, man, just kill an animal. It's going to freeze. But, but <laughs> no. how, how it's a, lot like, a lot like here, right? Yeah, our temperature last, especially last season, was incredible. It was it was super hot every single day. It didn't cool off till late, late September. It was, mm-hmm. it was the hottest I've seen it. Yeah, absolutely. But man, you can absolutely early season take care of that and get that out. Mm-hmm. If you have a plan, man, if you have coolers that you have ice in and you can go ahead and uh, get to those coolers and get that meat off the bone like we're talking about, that's... Plus, that's going to save you when you get it to the processor, man, because you get it to the processor, they're handling it by weight, and they're not having to deal with the bone. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, they're not having to do the skinning. That's going to help you in the long run. You know, so, and it depends on how, what you want done with your meat as well. But if you have a plan so that once you get it from your back to your vehicle or to your end uh, destination there where you can get it off the bone and get it on ice or in some place nice and cooled down by a creek where it's hanging. Yeah. Eric. Yeah. 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 The other, the other thing I would say is in my plan, um, I always like, I have my kill kit, so I got all that ready, but I also have a set. I got, I got, um, I keep hydration stuff. I keep a lot of, so I, I, I it's called element LM. LMNT, I think, is enough. You can buy it, but it's got a thousand milligrams of sodium, potassium, yeah. magnesium. Mm-hmm. I always make sure that whenever I'm doing a pack out, that I've got plenty of hydration things to prevent. Because man, if you start cramping up, things start happening. Obviously, you train for it. You want your body ready to be able to haul things like that. But I always make sure that I've got plenty of hydration uh, elements. You know, sometimes I run low on water, I'll run out, but I always make sure that I've got something set up just for my pack out that helps me 
Because man, if you're hydrated and you're feeling good, I make sure I'm drinking. Because sometimes if you're you're packing an animal out, you're you're cutting him up. It takes a while. You're out in the hot mm-hmm. sun. You're it just does, grinding, yeah. grinding, grinding. Sometimes my hands would cramp up, so I make <clears> sure that I'm I'm pre- I'm prepping my body during that time too. Because once that meat gets on your back, well, that's when the the you know it's a grind. So make sure you've got stuff there that's going to support you in that pack out. You know, water. If you don't have a ton of water. Make sure you've got things to to rehydrate yourself in terms of your electrolytes. So that's a yep. big one. Yeah, yeah use a, it or yeah. liquid IV. I mean, both of them yeah, are really exactly. Uh-huh. And water D- sticks, man. Hiking Aridies, sticks, or... walking sticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great, great point right there. Uh, I never did until about three years ago, and <laughs> mm-hmm. that was like a game changer for me. It's like holy smokes. Uh, actually when I helped those kids out of Missouri, that's the first time I had walking sticks and we didn't start hauling meat out till like 10 30 at night. I'm like, Oh man, we were in some rough country. I was like, how did I ever do it without this? What yeah. a dummy I was. I just didn't want to haul them. I thought they're too much weight. Yeah. No, I'll never, I never go without those anymore. That's the yeah. best thing. Yep. So well, and just, and just the feat of breaking that animal down by yourself. That's a feat in itself right there. <sighs> yeah. And the thing is like you guys are saying, like get it off the bone. It doesn't have to look pretty. Like, don't yeah. worry about it looking pretty. Get it off the bone and get it in the bags and get it cooling. Keep it simple. Yeah. And, and at the same time, you know, if you are solo and you're breaking down an animal, on the breaking out part, take your time. Do not yeah. do something where you end up cutting or cutting slashing yourself. Yourself, mm-hmm. man. You know, uh, I mean, you'll get more efficient as you, as you do this kind of stuff and you get to it. Um, but... You know, I'm, I tell you what, man, I almost anymore, I keep a finger almost to the tip of my blade when I'm working inside something so that mm-hmm. I just, uh, mm-hmm. I know by feel where I am with something like that, man. And if you are doing with a partner, you know, do, you know, be aware of where that knife is going and how it's going, you know, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And our knives are so sharp. I mean, you know, we, we use our outdoor edge knives and when that blade gets dull, you get another scalpel. <laughs> I mean, golly, mm-hmm. you just breathe on something and it cuts it, you know? Yeah. So absolutely. Sure. Yeah. So Cody, why don't you handle Dan Ray's man? All right. Uh, next question comes from Dan Ray. Um, he's out of uh, central Utah. So he says, uh, the other Sunday, me and three of my boys were watching Dallas lose. That's one of my favorite <laughs> things to do, man. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm usual. Like usual. <laughs> like usual. I don't know if it I don't know if this is proceeding for the for the next uh, the next sentence of the previous. But like usual, uh the subject of elk hunting came up. My boys are in their mid to late thirties. And the subject, uh, what we thought, um, the subject of what we thought the most important things are about elk hunting. So the top three were one, being in elk shape, two, getting proficient with your bow, three, elk knowledge. Um, he says, uh, we all agreed, uh, all three are very important. All four of us had these in different order. I would like to know from each of you what order you would have them in. Thanks again and love your podcast. My first and foremost is uh, is the elk knowledge. Uh, you gotta you gotta know you gotta know what you're uh, what you're pursuing. So um, that that would be that would be the most important thing for me. So for me, it'd be for me it would be learning how to call. He, he needs that one in there. Elk knowledge. Gonna, though. I, I would yeah. I would elk throw that knowledge. in with elk knowledge, bro. Yeah, Same yeah. Here. yeah. That skill set. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. The whole thing about the order, like elk knowledge, getting proficient with your bow. What I find with elk hunters is they're a lot like boy basketball players that I've coached. I never had to coach guys shooting three-pointers because the first time they grab the basketball, they're running out and they're shooting three-pointers, right? So the getting proficient part with it is the fun thing that everybody wants to do. Everybody wants to shoot all the time, right? But what I find is so many people are trying to work on their calling, driving out to elk camp. And, you know, they're working on 
just the calling themselves itself. And that means if they're working on just making sounds, then they really haven't worked on understanding why they're calling or, right. you know, what, what different saying. sounds to do in different ways or what a scenario is. And I found this really because we, we've done some calling competitions um, at some of these shoots and we did scenario type calling competitions. And when you tell somebody to do a scenario calling competition, when they start to do a scenario like a, you know, uh, uh, a cow in heat type scenario or something like that, or um, a, a bull that is an advertising bull or something like that, they just do the same things. They do a bunch of cow call, they do a bunch of bugles. They don't <laughs> differentiate you know, when they're doing it, man. So they, you know, for the whole time they're doing bugles and a cow call bugle and cow call, because they really don't understand the different nuances of a scenario. Okay. So I would say myself, man, I would say elk knowledge, number yeah. one, Yeah. you know, because <clears throat> that's the thing that's going to create the encounter. Right. And not only is it going to create the encounter, but it's going to help you to close on the encounter because you're going to understand the behaviors. You're going to understand their anatomy better. You're going to understand, you know, um, when and how to draw on that. So much comes into that play of the realm of elk knowledge. Yeah. You know, that's that's where I'm at with it. What about you guys? I agree with the elk knowledge as well because mm -hmm. when you go with the elk knowledge, that's what brings it all together. Again, and that's yeah. where you're going to enjoy walking down the game trails, walking to the wallows. You're going to realize why those are there and how they came about. You know, those trails aren't just there. They're going from feeding to bedding. They're going to wallows. They're going to springs so they can get water. That's all knowledge. And when you bring it all together, man, that, that, that makes the essence of elk hunting for me. Yeah, finding elk's a big deal. You know, mm -hmm. when that comes with the elk knowledge, you know, yep. finding them is a big deal. I mean, well, we, you can, we can be all... an ace shot. You can be an ace yeah. shot, but if you don't mm -hmm. have anything to shoot at, it doesn't matter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and if you can't make them come to you, it ain't going to matter. That's I mean, absolutely. I mean, you can yeah. sneak in there and, you know, maybe get around them. But first of all, you got to have enough elk knowledge to be able to get around them, know where they're going to be. Where, Like Travis said, they're going to be in their travel corridors or their bedding areas or their feeding areas or you gotta you gotta have some type of elk knowledge to be able to put yourself in that in that yeah. position you know and yeah other, yeah otherwise uh you know you can get in really good shape and you can be yeah. a proficient shooter but then you go out there and you're just hiking that's yeah. hiking nature hikes yeah and yeah. and and i don't know about you guys but if you're in the middle of elk season and you're not getting into elk that's very discouraging. Yeah. So the knowledge that brings it, that's going to make your hunt go from just a mediocre hike, like Chav said, mm -hmm. to top notch. Like, oh my God, what just happened? We put that animal down, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and really, it's those encounters and experiences from being around those animals that drive all those other things that drive you to become a better shot, that drive you to get in better condition. I've seen people that have gone out there and had an experience, had an encounter of a lifetime because they've never had that. And their life has changed forever. That's all they have on their in their head yeah. man, is elk hunting. I, man, I got to get in better shape. I want to do this better. And yeah, it's I. I, I think that is the driving force right there. Yeah. I yeah. think, you, you know, them elk knowledge uh, and then being able to speak the language is huge, man. Uh, to to yeah. get it. Then I would put shape and then being proficient with your bow. You know, uh, I mean, we're going to work. I, I agree with all of that. Yeah. yeah. I mm -hmm. think, man, it's scary. I, here I'm going to go and promote our the base camp, but. <laughs> honestly if i had this base camp 25 years ago oh my I, I i guarantee you i'd have i'd have 10 more elk under yeah. my belt yeah. yeah i probably would have the biggest bull i've ever seen i would have killed him <laughs> had i just had knowledge and yeah. uh but i was winging it I, yeah. I was learning on the fly but uh it's all that knowledge that drives the other things you guys have been talking about you know it just it, it leads you down different paths to round your skill sets out. So yeah, knowledge and I think the rest of it just flows along with it. So I want you to look at what you did this year, bro. I mean, you took a guy out there um, and taught him 
He went through the academy. You guys went out. You worked on scenarios. You you developed a plan, worked on different parts of the game set, and go out. And how many times has he been hunting elk, man? Uh, he'd hunted with a rifle a couple uh-huh. of times. I, I guided him last year. Never even saw an elk the two days he was with me. I felt horrible, but we started talking. He's He brought it up, and when – I mean, he was he was a special ops guy, uh, Air Force uh, yeah. pararescue guy, and I thought, man, I get my claws in this dude because he sounds like he's a backcountry guy. He likes to. He sounds a little crazy like me. Sure enough, we start talking. He's like, hey, uh, and I was explaining what was going on. He said, man, would you mentor me? Would you take me under your wing? And and mm-hmm. and I said, I would absolutely love to do that. And I said, matter of fact, I feel bad guiding you that I didn't get you on an elk. Let me buy the base camp for you. And it started from there. And then after that, he just became like the grasshopper man. Mm-hmm. And Dave, that guy's so meticulous. You can tell why he's a special operator, obviously, man. Mm-hmm. But, I think I'm just... type a. but yeah, he, he just, he absorbed every bit of knowledge that he wanted to, everything. He was just grinding through that. So being able to coach him through the base camp, I mean, Taking him literally, that's how I coached him was the way that camp was set up, mm-hmm. you know, from, from the end to all the way bound through. So when we got out there, the guy was ready to execute. He was just, and he did, he, he performed, I mean, first bull, 20 yards. First ever normal. archery hunt. First, first ever, ever archery, archery hunt. hunt. <laughs> and Steals his tag and with a beautiful has, bull. Yeah. Smashes a bull and has, has. He doesn't start going. The bull dies five yards in front of him. It's right in front of him. You know, he smoked him, but he has the he has the knowledge from all stuff we talked about. He didn't move because he saw cows. He let them cows, and I called them cows. He let the cows walk right by him, and then she walked right into my, you know, right in her. She was looking for me, and I had her, you know, 30 yards broadside. <laughs> I said, well, lights out, baby. This hunt's over. Ten minutes, we were yeah. done. I was like... <laughs> Me, like me. man it's over that fast i go dude this is unbelievable i said yeah it doesn't i thought we'd be out here for i said i'm a grinder you can ask my wife anytime yeah. we go hunt she's like oh yeah you're gonna be out there all 10 days i already know how it's gonna go <laughs> yeah. you ain't killing the first day i'm like yeah we killed on the second day in 10 minutes but yeah um again awesome. and if you ask david he'll tell you it's all that knowledge it was the coaching um you know and then you know, just like all that stuff lined up for us. But that's, you know, as a coach, that's what I want to see is I've, been, I've co- tried to coach other people, but if they don't want to do those things that make you successful and don't believe in it, he bought into that because yeah. he didn't have the experience. But as he went through the course, it just taught him so much. And then I'd, I'd see him start to ask questions, start to really um, – build that knowledge base and he started to build confidence like okay now i understand what we're doing once he started to understand those things i mean now he's like dude i'm gonna call a bull in for you nobody's ever called a bull in for me all the years i've ever hunted so i'm like okay you can be the first guy to do it so, yeah that's awesome, sweet. Man. yeah, yeah. Awesome. so hi anyway, right, gil sorry i said so fantastic well guys y'all know what time it is oh, no. it's time for the oh, no. shout out no. if you're new to our no, show no, this is a shout out to our followers and fans in a few cities with the most listeners topping our charts this week yep and gil before we start two things bro <clears throat> i'm gonna give a shout out to a new podcast out there geared to the over 50 crowd of outdoorsmen and the issues that age bring on with it, man. So <laughs> it's called, I love the name, man. And look, this is from our friend, Ed Morse out of Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, yeah. Man behind this. And, you know, what an incredible and super knowledgeable hunter and human being both Ed is, man. He's just just one of those great guys, man. And his podcast can be found on Podbean, and it's called the Grizzled Outdoors podcast. <laughs> the Grizzled, I love that, man. Hey, grizzled, yeah. man. <laughs> so I wanted to give them a plug, man. So um, also mm-hmm. wanted to thank those folks leaving us reviews on Apple Podcasts. Our buddy, Chris McKelvey, um, who has now moved to an elk hunting state, and this guy is in high cotton. He says he began listening after we started doing this, and he hasn't missed an episode yet. Um, Dan61, <laughs> I like this, man. Really enjoys the show and said it's 
this is the this is the Gilbert disclaimer. It's basically clean energy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> basically. Uh, yeah, stick around, man. They'll get you know a Beto unleashed here before you know it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's Manano. Come on, Beto, give us some yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You guys enter in our in our hunt and you'll get to get it on the full Monty being camp. You can ask our kid Cody right here. John, John Child loves the really what ifs, do. man. He was really into the what ifs, and and I, man, I tell you what, man. Just I saw this when I read this. It just uh, our brother Cole Wilkes, man. Cole said, you know, and Cole doesn't have to do this, man. And I thought it was really cool that he did. Says that this podcast is more than learning. Says it's a brotherhood, and that we all preach from the heart. So, um, some pretty cool stuff you, there. Yeah. yeah, my boys, my the brother from another mother himself. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I'm gonna see him this weekend, so I'm looking forward to spending some time with Big Cole. Sweet. It's uh, time cool. well spent, man. Yep, awesome. So let's get uh, to our top listening city, Eric. You're up. Uh, I'm on fire for this one. So this used to be <laughs> once called a, it was called a forest city, right? So the town was named after the Scottish ancestral county, where some of the earliest settlers in this town actually came from, but. What's interesting is uh, this town got started shortly after the Burlington Railroad had built like a short line between Omaha and Ashland and, and back in the summer of 1886. Um, so it's it's really an interesting place. Um, just like, I like, again, I like sports, but uh, in, the, in the 38th year of kind of honoring the nation's best high school athletes, Gatorade this year announced that uh, this quarterback named Zane Flores, uh, he was he was named as the 2022-2023 Gatorade Nebraska Player of the Year, which is super cool. And he this kid lives in a town of about 5,000 people. But uh, in the, the town that we're recognizing that's showing up, you know, on the Elk Bros map today is is a big shout out to Gretna, Nebraska. So, Gretna, Nebraska. Nebraska. Yeah, you ever been there, big man? I, you know, yeah. I've been I've been through Nebraska, but I don't believe I've ever been to Greta. Yeah, I, yeah, it sounds like a pretty cool place. Uh, yeah, they have one of the largest shopping areas in in the place, but it's got a, an area called the Gretna Crossing Park. So they got right. a plan to build like this big old park, it's like 157 acres. So it sounds like a pretty cool place to go hang out. And I'm sure the food's good, but uh, anyway, big shout out to Gretna. Thanks for listening, yep. Greta. Uh, okay, uh, Barn Bluff, this top listening city's most famous landmark, uh, began forming over half a billion years ago and has been used by Native Americans as a lookout for approaching enemies <laughs> as well as building materials for the railroads and even a disembarkment location for thousands of immigrants. And this is in Red Wing, Minnesota. Oh, cool. Red, Red Wing, Wing, Minnesota. Red Wing, Minnesota in the house. <laughs> Yeah. So is that Land where like lakes. is that where like the Red Wing shoe thing? Red Wing. That's what I was thinking. The same. That's thing. what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah it could know, be. Joe. In, in there a I hockey team that's the Red Wings too? Or yes, I'm imagining that. Yeah, but that's Detroit. That's Detroit. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wouldn't yeah, know, Detroit. man. You know those <laughs> those guys, man. They just uh, it's like them crazy Canucks up there, man. You give them a stick and a puck, <laughs> and they go crazy. Yeah. So. <laughs> man, yeah, they like to fight. They don't even want to use the stick and the puck, dude. They just yeah, want to, so, they just want to uh, throw down. <laughs> yeah, uh, Red Wing, Minnesota is the that's they have a factory there for Red Wing shoes. So Red that's Wing where the heritage oh. comes from. Nice, yeah, got, got that right. Cool. I've worn Red Wings my whole field career. That's for sure. Well, next up, Joe, with a population of about 1,200 folks, this next top listening city was originally called St. Olaf. The river park on the west of the Big Sioux River is a popular family location. But if you're looking for a full belly and a gathering place for the city, then you need to visit the Someday Cafe in Baltic, South Dakota. Baltic, South, South Dakota. Dakota. And I have been there. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah. You've, been Sunday cafe? You've been to the Someday Cafe? <laughs> no, not been to the Someday Cafe. Been through Baltic, <laughs> South Dakota. Yep. Been on the Big Sioux River and stuff like that. So, yep. Did some fishing up there in the Francis Case and Lewis and Clark Reservoir. So, nice. beautiful so we got, country. 
We got the someday yeah. bathroom happening in our house, man. We started doing <laughs> <laughs> we, we started someday. doing renovations, man. I think we started breaking down walls back in, I don't know, October or something like that, man. And we're just in the bathroom with all these broken down walls, man. I think it's <laughs> someday, someday we're gonna finished, have huh? us a bathroom, man. That's funny, <laughs> Kid, let us have it, baby. All right. Uh, well, just saying the name of this next top listening city is uh, it's fun. Uh, once the land of the Mohawk tribe, Thomas Edison began General Electric here, and George Westinghouse invented the rotary engine and air brakes here as well. And uh, I had to look it up, but it is Schenectady, New York. Schenectady. 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 That's a cool name. <laughs> no matter how you get out there. <laughs> well, the first thing I saw when I went to their uh, their town page was the uh, snowplow map, and uh, <laughs> oh no, mount. <laughs> that'll tell you anything. Yeah, I don't want to see another snowplow. <laughs> 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 Here we go. What if there was a way to flatten your elk hunting learning curve and have the experience of a lifetime, gaining decades of elk hunting knowledge and skill sets that'll take your DIY confidence and ability to a whole new level? Look no further. Welcome to Elk Bros Adventures in our coached adventure camp, an elk hunting experience like no other. Your prep and training starts months before you ever step foot on the mountain. Our campers have weekly online training sessions with each member of our Elk Pro Success Squad in all aspects of the hunt. Gear, physical condition, archery setup, failure points to avoid, shooting proficiency, finding elk, locating, behavior calling, setup, and closing the deal. From the moment you get to elk camp, the boots on the ground training begins. Each camper will have one of the Uprose trained coaches with them throughout the hunt, not guiding, but teaching and helping you to learn and apply those lessons. For the price of what many today are paying for tags alone, you will be smashing that DIY learning curve, becoming a more knowledgeable, capable, effective, confident, and therefore successful DIY elk hunter. Y'all, hunt preparation like no other, a learning experience like no other, an elk hunting adventure like no other. For more information, go to elkbros.com forward slash hunt. That's elkbros.com forward slash hunt. Flattening that learning curve, now there is a way. Well, cheers to the elk bros, huh? Cheers. 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 A great cheers. elk hunt. Yes, sir. All right, guys, let's get to the main content, man. Um, Sounds good. You know, last week we talked about some things um, and trying to keep this simplistic. Sometimes when you keep things simplistic, it seems like we kind of go back into our earliest days of starting to do hunting because I think a lot of us were very simplistic when we started this stuff out. Mm -hmm. But I, I want people to realize, too, when we say simple, you know, it, and it doesn't mean that it wasn't successful. Mm -hmm. It's just um, I, we get so overburdened these days, man. I think people get so many different things that they got to get all of this stuff or they have to do things this way or, you know, I've got to. It's just you get all this information. So our goal is, is just going to kind of break this down. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to try to break it down. And one thing is, you know, that we keep hearing from a lot of people is, OK, where to hunt now? When we talk about where to hunt being basic, yeah. you know, um, we can definitely get this as deep and complicated as we want to, right? For sure. I mean, our technology's changed so much over the last 20 years, mm -hmm. Joe. You know, technology's really taken a burden off of us being scared to get off the beaten path, right? So yeah. a lot of guys didn't want to get too far off the trail for <laughs> scared it's going to get dark and you not be able to find their way back, man. But technology is so there now where we can just go till we, till we decide we don't want to go anymore or where, however far we want to go. Right. But so. I even want to break this down even just a little bit deeper. Like people try to decide like, 
well, what state should I go or what county should I go or what hunt unit? And then we're going to do like what you're talking about, Gilbert, like, you know, where should I hunt? And I think that's going to feed into scouting basics that we have right after that. But I'm, I'm going to give the most simplistic answer that I can, man, is Mm -hmm. go hunt elk where you can get a tag. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and everywhere everywhere you can put in for a tag OTC, I mean, and where you can draw, try to draw. You know, yeah. the the most yeah. important thing is to get a tag, man, yeah. or get some place where you can hunt an animal. The most important thing is if you're trying to decide where you're going to go hunt. Most of these places, it's real easy these days, like Gilbert said, because of technology. There's a lot of research. You got Top Rod out there. You got Go Hunt out there. You can do your own homework and to go to the game and fish. And they do reports every year on things like they they go out and they um they do counts, man. They do you know they have biologists that get all this information. You can find migration corridors. And I'll tell you this: when we were going to go hunt Colorado, you know, people mm-hmm. like the the unit that we decided to go hunt and everybody was like man i don't know man if i'd go there you got to bring your own rock you know to stand on to go there but we don't worry about people we just wanted to know that there was right and and able to see migration corridors and if elk are migrating in corridors that means there's going to be elk in those areas so i think the most important thing is number one draw a tag And then after you draw the tag for an area and you know because of information that you can get that there's elk in the area, um, that's where you're going to start hunt, right, to get your experience. Yeah, Yeah. and and even if you want to take it simpler than that, if you can't draw a tag or if you can't buy buy a tag over the counter, find a buddy that's going hunting and see if you can tag along with him and maybe do some calling if you know a little bit of calling. but just get out there and get your feet wet. And then the next year, Hey, you might have your own tag. You know, at our, at our, um, at the show this weekend that we were at here in Albuquerque, I had so many people that I was saying, are you an elk hunter? And I would get this reply. Oh, if I could ever draw. And so my first question was, and this, I know this applies in New Mexico because we have a different system, but my first question was, well, where are you putting in, you know? And most yeah. of the people were only putting in for one unit when you have the opportunity to put in for three. And then what people do is if they put in for three, they put in some of these what are considered premier units all as their top three. And what I was telling people is because mm-hmm. of our system, you want to put in the place that you really want to go. There's your top choice on the top. And then you find a place with <laughs> – and, you know, I talk about success rates – I don't worry about that too much, but I was like a place that has good amount of tags where you feel that's a comfortable place you'd want to go because it gives you more opportunity. And then for your third choice, find the lowest success rate place you can pretty much in New Mexico because success rates only tell you the quality of the hunter. You know, if you're, if you're reading that there are so many thousands of elk in that area, there are elk there then success is up to you. So I was like, find one with low success rates because that's a place that most people aren't going to want to go, right? So, yeah, yeah. people are tied into that. But that was something that that I was talking about, you know, as far as where to hunt this, you know, as far as that goes. But now, where to hunt when you're on boots on the ground? So let me just ask you guys this. And Trav, I'm going to start with you. Because I know that you can probably, I mean, you went to go work in an area that you had never been this year. Mm -hmm. And I bet within an hour or two, you already had it in your mind whether or not that was a place to hunt elk. Yeah. So even just driving out, it was a couple hours from my hometown. Just driving out, I was like a dog with my nose to the ground, like driving along, looking at the side of the road because we got snow everywhere. I'm looking for tracks just as I'm going, right? So the scouting was happening in my mind, and I didn't even know it, you know. So that's that's part of it. If you don't know the area, you can scout it, like you say, on the maps. But if you just happen to go camping somewhere, look for tracks along the way. And, <clears throat> yeah, definitely. I, I know for a fact I could go there and find elk in a, in a heartbeat. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I'm, I mean, for myself, I mean, <laughs> I can be going along and I can look in an area. This happened in Colorado when we were there. This happened, happened in New Mexico this year. Mexico this year when we were mm. there. I'm driving by an area. There's a water source of a river down in the bottom. And I look up and we've got a thick area that's got north, northeast, lots of aspen choking with a lot of benches is going up. And it has a, it basically has three drainages coming down into one, what I call a crow's foot. Now, whenever I see something like that, that has a water source at the bottom, has grass at the bottom, has place for animals mm -hmm. to bed, has a flat area up on the top of it where they don't even necessarily have to come down. They can go up and eat up on the top and then drop down on the side. Or if it's a place that goes from a north northeast side with a saddle over into another south area or other areas that have feet, those are areas that automatically tell me that that's a place that I could possibly hunt. But like you were saying, Trav, and let's throw this into scouting basics. What do for my scouting basics? You can ask Chav, man. What's the first thing that we do, Chav, when we grab the bike? What are we looking for? Oh, well, other than looking for tracks on the road, yep. uh, and you said water source, but um, we look uh, in our area, we always check the acorns, see if there's acorn, mm -hmm. if there's food a, sources, if there's a, right? Yeah, if, if there's a big acorn crop because that's that's a dead giveaway of where they're going to be at most of the time, but. Yeah, food sources, um, and and water, of course. Um, well, you jumped over it, but I'm not going to jump over it that quick, man. We ride the roads like crazy way before mm -hmm. the season, looking for track. We try to find any mud hole to see if there's any track in that. Water sources, going to water sources and trying to find track around those and then reverse engineering. Because if you're seeing a lot of track around water sources, that means those animals are traveling there for water. There has to be a food source near there or it has to be an ed a bedding area near there. So, I mean, up in where you're yeah. at, Trav, you guys have a lot of different water sources. In Colorado, they have a lot of different water sources. But when you yeah. drive roads between some of those, and you can see low-lying saddles in different places from one area to the other, natural type funnels, you know. I'm always yeah. looking for the areas that those elk are going to a corridor that they're going to traverse through. And if we yeah. like that said, if we find food sources, man, we we know we're going to be in the money. The other thing I key on, Joe, is when I'm when I'm traveling those road systems, I'm watching for the hillsides and if you see pockets of uh, coniferous trees like pines and spruce trees, and they're mixed in with all the poplar and all that stuff, the pines are where the, where the elk are going to mostly bed here because it's a cooler environment for them. Thicker. And that's what they're seeking, right? It's thicker, it's cooler. So as I'm traveling these road systems, I'm keying in on those spots. And if they happen to be in a little bowl or uh, on a bench, you know, where it benches out, all those things, and you add into those water, like your crow's foot, the water on the three three parts coming down. Drainage, you know yeah. they're, they're, that water up there is starting somewhere. So it's going to start in the spring. And if it comes down into little low spots, it's going to form a wallow. So, I mean, you put all that. It sounds like a lot in your head, but when you start thinking like an elk, what they need, they need food, they need security, they need water. That's mm -hmm. really what they need. You know, and then come the breeding season, that's a whole different thing altogether. But those three, that's the key right there. And so and let me you, ask you this, you, fellas. You pair that up with some fresh droppings. Oh, boy. yeah. Oh, my gosh. Right. Yeah. Okay, so. Man, I remember this year when we were. Go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry, Gilbert. I'm going to ask you, man. There's two times of scouting, right? There's time a little yeah. bit ahead of season and there's time on the hunt, right? Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. right, right, right. So how are you handling those two different? Well, I think I think for me the pre pre scouting is huge. You know, my e scouting and stuff like that to try to identify the areas that you talked about. That crow's foot that leads into a you know a water source, and then where are the feeding areas going to be between those? Uh, those are those are the things that I want to identify, especially those north facing slopes, northeast facing slopes, so you can identify their corridors. And, and I want to do that 
early, right? And if I can get there a couple of days early and, and go scout those areas, then I'm really looking for blown up trees. I'm looking for, you know, then that takes a different turn, looking for blown, blown up trees and fresh droppings. Uh, we were hunting in New Mexico this year and we hunted a long time and never saw any fresh droppings. There were mm -hmm. some old tracks, but no fresh droppings. And Joe or somebody might have made a comment that these elk don't poop around here. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm going to tell you the real deal is there ain't no elk here. That's the deal, <laughs> right? When there's no fresh poop, because they do a lot of it, they not no mm -hmm. elk there, man. Uh, so, and, and when we went into areas that had fresh sign, it was loaded with elk, right? Had fresh, yeah. fresh dung, fresh every. I mean, so that was huge for me to see areas that were barren and not. And, and look, it had old, old sign there that was very dry and very but no fresh, right? So for me, it was real simple to discount that quickly, right? And I'm not saying that elk won't move through there, but at the end of the day, they weren't being resident elk there, you know? And right. that's a difference, right? There's a difference mm -hmm. between a migrating herd and a resident herd, right? And, uh, and even as a resident herd, they move, you know, throughout their day, miles, huh, Joe? I mean, we've seen, uh, herds depending, move three to yeah. three to yeah. five miles to go to water yeah you know? depend, depending on you know if if i have a good resident herd i'm hoping to find an area that has their three things that are going to keep them in there exactly. you exactly. know because that's going to make it a lot easier for me to hunt them <laughs> rather than something that's going three miles away you know yeah. like what we were dealing with yeah. but you know and our pressure pre human pressure will cause yeah. that to uh, cause that to deviate right so uh, but basics, man, e-scouting, e man, like Joe talked about, get that down, figure out your corridors where, you know, where your north facing slopes are, man, and go put boots on the ground and, and get after so many cool things to use. There's uh, my favorite is Onyx because it's so simplistic. Base maps is good. Go hunts. I mean, there's so many different uh fat map i love fat maps because fat maps tells this fat boy where to walk right and it's got it shows you identically where the big steepness is and where it isn't you know so it can show you a little drain to go over you know a little trinos that goes in between two big <laughs> drainages that ain't i had somebody ask me about right? trinos the other day they, they said they've looked it up and i can't find trinos man. <laughs> <laughs> man, come on now <clears throat> It's it's a creek or little valley that just uh, creates a little depression where it's a travel corridor, you know, and uh, those elk will use those little indentions. Uh, mm -hmm. And some people call them coolies. I mean, there's a whole different name for them, but they use them like highways. You know? Oh, yeah. So, you know? Eric, you have down in the Gila, man, all that country looks alike, man. And, you know, you have a lot of people that we always talk about these feed areas and different things like that. But the Gila is a lot of those rolling hills. It's not necessarily where we have these steep ridge mountains all the time and coming down. And, you know, it's a little bit different in a lot of those areas. Now, there are mountainous areas there, oh, yeah. but a lot of that has those rolling hills and those running ridges and stuff like that that <clears throat> looks a lot alike. So how do you handle your scouting in an area like that? Um, yeah, so like in the wilderness from honey, it's real <laughs> steep country. So... Um, I, I tend to look for them up high if it's hot, and then I start working my way down a little bit lower. Um, but I'm always looking for, you know, real good grasses. Uh, I'm I'm checking water sources all the time, making sure, and I'm looking for those travel corridors. Um, this year was a little different. <clears throat> like um, I, I hauled water in a month before. That was the first time I never saw water in one of the biggest water holes there. I mean, it was bone dry. Freaking wow. me out. So I knew I knew there wasn't going to be water anywhere else. So I thought, man, okay, I got to figure something out here. So I had a plan. Like I knew where another big tank was, but it wasn't in my hunting unit. But I knew just by the terrain that it would hold elk, and the elk would probably come and bed in this certain area. Well, we go back in there. It got so much rain that I'm walking through a meadow, and I've never walked through there in 25 years where the water was this deep. You know. Uh, it was, you know, your, your feet were wow. soaking wet. It's like in that matter of time, it changed everything. Oh. Um, yeah, but um, 
but so okay all right now we i'm hearing all this but i still like you said you looked for them high and look around i want to know if we're if you had to say one basic thing to somebody to yeah. to be able to scout an area what's your basic thing my basic thing is i'm looking for, it's it's really the three things i'm looking for north facing slopes right I'm looking for water source and a feed area that are all close within that there range. And I look for those things, those three things right there every time. Now, just because I can identify it on a map like I did, I thought this year I'm going to try another area. I've never <laughs> hunted there. I've been hunting my, I didn't even hit my honey hole. We didn't even kill these elk in my honey hole. This is a whole other area that I tried. And the day before, I went to rule out areas that I thought, I, I thought, oh man, I, th I think this place right here will hold a ton of elk, man. There was no sign there. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. So, wow. so the, yeah. So the one thing I would also say, and we talked about it and I even talked about it with the guys at hunt wars is a lot of times when you're building your plan about where to hunt and you guys say it all the time, it isn't plan a it's plan a through Z. Z, you better have Z, a lot Z. of spots picked out now, depending yeah. on how many days you got, you're going to have days where you're not going to jump a thing. I mean, some days you might be right on them, depending on the hunt. This was early season. I knew I needed to find the cows, find them, but I had to work so hard with these guys. Don't get so discouraged. You're ruling air. Every hunter goes through that. you got to rule areas out just because it looks like it's going to hold it. Now you're putting boots on the ground and you're going to confirm it. You're not seeing it. Like you're saying, Hey, I've got nothing but old sign. They're not here right now. They're somewhere else. Let's move to the next plan. Man. Once those guys started doing that, guess what? They started finding out and then their whole attitude changed. So I tell them, Hey, don't worry about it. That's part of hunting. I've spent mm -hmm. eight, nine days trying to find out. And, but when I find them, they're in trouble. So yeah, exactly. I think that's, that's I, I, the big thing. Your hunt <laughs> basics is you better have, multiple plans to find out because yeah. they're not easy to find sometimes I, i'm you just going to tell you my mine are i want to find the roads and trails and i want to get on them and locate track Quickly. if i'm finding track that they're utilizing areas or crossing areas that immediately as soon as i'm driving a road and i see a multiple track and by the way guys early season before the season i'm looking for cow track i'm not looking yeah. for bull track i want to mm -hmm. know where the cows are man and then right. when i start when I start getting in the actual season, you know, I'm looking for as many tracks as I can find there. I'm not looking necessarily for those singles because I think those singles are bulls that are mm. out there now. They're cruising, starting to look for those cows. Yeah. So if I'm going down rows and I see a whole bunch of track mm. going across, all I got to do is look, which direction are they going? Which direction did they come from? What are the possibilities of where, you know, if they came down in the you know, uh, in the evening and they cross that area, where did they just come from? Cause that's a possible bedding area. Where are they going to? Cause that's a possible feed area. Is there water yeah. down there? Right. Yeah. By taking track and going on trails and seeing those trails that they're using and what, man, that they are making like little highways that they're doing it regularly. If I'm seeing trails that are dug in because of regular use man that is a huge sign of where they're going and where they're coming from so i like to yeah. use those areas to tell me that elk are in an area because i know because their tracks are there man mm -hmm. so i will ride the heck out of areas in rubber neck men whether on a four-wheeler whether in a vehicle looking on those dirt roads looking those mud holes side by side, and then man i'm gonna go on those watered areas and I'm going to look for track coming to it and going away from it, man. So get to where you can find their feet marks. And if you find their feet marks, you can find where they came from and where they're going. That's my most basic scouting technique, most basic right there, you know, yeah. as far as I can give you. The other thing I would say is if, um, and I see this all the time, uh, like hunting in the wilderness, every, I'll run into guys and they'll do the big loop. They walked 13, 14 miles, but guess what they did the whole day? They walked the trail. Mm -hmm. They walked the, the trail. trail. They didn't. They didn't get down and start working these. They, you didn't need to go that far. You didn't right. have to start working your way across, getting into you know cover, different. Mm -hmm. Get a couple of ridges over. That's where they are. Mm -hmm. They're not right off yeah, that. I see a lot of guys. Yeah, yeah they, I didn't see nothing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And they Even weren't paying here. attention to the wind either. You know, good point. Yeah, good point. that 
that's the scary part. Yeah, they walked right around and their scent is everywhere now. That's the yeah. same like here. Like you got to get off the main cut lines and trails and get on the game trails and start following those because exactly. especially early season here, you got to be within 80, 100 yards before you're going to get a reply or any kind of noise like an antler hitting a tree or something like that from a bull back, right? If you're 200 yards away, they're just going to listen to you go by and before they know it, you're gone and they're back to doing their normal thing, right? And you missed out on the whole game. <laughs> Yeah, now you're mm-hmm. talking about the hunt, and I'm talking about scout, right? Trying to figure yeah. out where I'll be, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Once I'm in an area where they're where they're at, I mean, you've got. I've seen elk that have bedded 80 yards to 100 yards off of roads and never cross that, and people driving by them all day long. Uh, yeah, in those areas, right? <clears throat> they, I, killed they, big, I killed my biggest bull not 150 yards off of a road. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Joe, I don't know about your theory on uh, the droppings from from the animals. Mm-hmm. For me, there, there there's three different uh, variables. There's the green fresh one that right. literally they're right in front of you, and then there's the three or four hour one that's just starting to brown over. A little brown but when off. yeah, you step on it and it's green inside and it's still lush. Right. And then you get the day or two old stuff that's just brown and starting to dry out and it's dark brown all the way through. Right. So that's really important to keep note of even when you're scouting, because you know, Absolutely. okay, why, why were they here in July? Why were they here in August? Right. And you can pinpoint those food sources and those, those elk, they do a loop back and forth. They'll always come back to their food source again. And they, for around here, it's like a seven day cycle. It seems like, cause it's just like us. They don't want to eat the same thing day in, day out. You they don't know, want to eat themselves get... out of house and home either, right? Yeah. That too, yeah. yeah, yeah. And you know how it is eating the same thing every day. You got to move on after a while, and especially if you got predators like bears and wolves and stuff. Like there's wolves everywhere where you guys are. So that's kind of one thing to really watch for. And like say your trail system. I love what you're saying there, Joe, because you're looking at the tracks. What direction are they going? That that lines up everything your your bedding area to your feeding to your to your water it all builds that whole picture and it's so simple when you break it down like that yeah and i i like to find those trails that are running down finger ridges or down in between finger ridges they'll either walk down in the bottom and they'll walk down at the top then you'll find those angled ones that go from the bottom up to the top up there um yeah we call them funnels yeah you know we call There's, them funnels yeah. or pinch, funnel pinch points mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. So that that's kind of on the scouting on as far as the basics. There's a lot you can get a lot more in depth to the scouting part of it and get a lot yeah. more difficult and look for different. But I just want somebody to have an idea, man, of what to do. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and that's why I'm talking about, you know, before Basic. that season, how we just run those areas and we try to find those places to find track, man, because I'm finding track, that means there's critters there. Yeah. And yeah. Before season, I'm looking for cows, man. Even during season, I'm hoping to find cows there because that's, you know, it's kind of like that field of dreams. You build it and they will come, right? So yes. those bulls are going to come find those cows, man. Well, and the thing yeah. is, we all we all love to run those trail cameras and see the big bulls on the cameras. And holy crap, look at this bull. This is awesome. <laughs> I don't care about any of that. I want to see the girls. You know, you see the cows and the cows. <laughs> The bulls are going to be there. <laughs> you just, Absolutely. You play the waiting game. They're showing up. Absolutely. So, so let's go to the next one, camping basics. <clears throat> and, you know, um, uh, Cody, <laughs> you had to prepare this year and getting ready to come out. Now, I, I'm I'm not too sure how <clears throat> basic you were or, or were you. And if you had to just, I mean, this is a guy that packs up and unpacks, I don't know, like 20,000 freaking times before he gets out there, man. <laughs> but if you, too elaborate, though, Joe, it's pretty basic. Yeah, you know what? He really was, man. When you take a look at it, I mean, it it wasn't something that was majorly elaborate when they got there. They they had some nice things, like they had a nice yeah. little awning that flipped out on their vehicle and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But because they had that on their vehicle, they actually had a pretty quick camp with some cover and stuff like that. But if you had to give somebody advice as far as, and I'm, there's two areas that I want to talk about with camping. And the area is like, 
what is some of just maybe some of the basic stuff you got to have to be comfortable in camp? And then I want to talk about the basics of selecting a campsite. All right. So what would you say, Cody, as far as some of the gear, man? Well, I, I would say, you know, uh, you know, a, a good quality tent, if you're going to just tent out is, is great. Um, and, and I, I don't think it really matters what kind of tent you got. I would be very selective on, um, you know, what you're sleeping on. So, it, you know, yeah. we, we had cots this year and man, it was, it, it was great. Um, way better than sleeping on the ground, way easier as far as getting up in the morning, getting ready. Um, you know, and the other thing that I, that I thought about as far as with, you know, my camping setup is, can I break it down fast? Can I put it in my truck and move if I need to move? Absolutely. You know, if, if, the, if the elk are not where I'm at, I'm not going to stay there and beat a dead horse. I'm going to pack it up and let's move. So, um, I, I would say, uh, comfort, comfort sleeping, and then mobile would be the two things I'd be looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I totally yeah, agree with that, because you need to man. get your rest. <laughs> because, man, your rest is critical. I mean, uh, a good bag, uh, comfortable to sleep on. Um, you know, when sleep we were bag. younger, Chav and I, we slept in the back. You know, our pickup was where we slept, in the back of the pickup. You know, we had a, uh, a cab on the back of it, and we slept in there and kept gear in the front part of the truck. And... We were plenty comfortable, dry, didn't have to worry about anything. But, you know, uh, another thing that we like to do as far as uh, when we have a, a tent camp, especially in areas that get a lot of rain, is we actually like to pull a tarp over our tent to kind of ensure that, you know, the tent staying dry. It don't have to be the greatest tent in the world if you got extra protection on it and gives you some, some room to put other stuff underneath of it as well. So that's one of the things that we did. Yeah, yeah man, and it if you like a tent city, man. A lot of times when we were 10, we're getting a little spoiled now with the Taj Mahal. <laughs> like that. The, yeah. boy, the boys yeah. have gotten them a new trailer and everything. But yeah, I mean, I remember when we were first getting after it, Joe's like tent city. We'd build all kinds of walls up and you name it, man. It was cool. And, and not to mention when it did get warmed up during the day, you had a nice, cold, <laughs> cool place to go in there and, yeah. and Shady uh, area. take a nap. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Hey, Hey, Joe, you mentioned what in your early days, you and Chav in the back of the truck there. I'm just curious, who is the big spoon and who's the little spoon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God>. Actually, <laughs> yeah, because those trucks weren't that big. I, yeah. I remember seeing some of y'all's trucks were pretty, pretty smaller on the smaller side. It wasn't full size truck. Yeah, it wasn't full size. The only thing about being stuck with a partner in one of them small areas like that is we always raced to to try to get to sleep before the other First. guy. Man, because yeah. Otherwise, you were there listening to them, you know, ronk or breathing deep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look, I got, yeah. one, I got one thing that you got to have, man, and don't forget, and it's your bag gun uh, pillow. Pillow. Your pillow. Oh, yeah. Don't forget your pillow, because yeah. I'm telling you, it sucks having your knapsack under your head for seven days, man, or your oh, backpack yeah. or whatever. Man, bring you if you can bring you a nice little pillow to lay your head on, because it makes a difference. And yeah. you know, I, I don't go nowhere without earplugs. There you go. Even it, even even when I'm sleeping out, you know, I'm I'm packed in there, and I got a partner. Yeah it's even worse if I don't take them because I hear everything, then I don't sleep. So yeah. I just, I just yeah. tell my partner who it is to say, I got earplugs in. So if anything walks up, up on us, you're going to have to be the one to yell out. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to risk getting eaten, but I got to sleep and noise is like the biggest thing for me. I even sleep here at home. I sleep with earplugs at night. Wow. Yeah. And if, if you're in real tight quarters and you've eaten Manano stuff, you gotta have a little. You gotta have a little ventilation right. too. Yeah, <laughs> you may want to put plugs. Put those earplugs in the other hole. A little bit of Vicks. Put a little vape, vapor rub. Yeah. <laughs> but let's talk about. Uh, so when we when we break it down to basics, we want to make sure our sleeping system is comfortable. We want to make sure that we stay dry, and we want to make sure that we stay mobile. That's pretty much the basics that we want. You know, when we do yeah. things and when Gilbert talked about our yeah. tent city, when we put up a tent city like that, 
that was a base camp and our mobility was not in our camp. Our camp was staying there. Our, yeah. And this is because it's a little different when you hunt in New Mexico and you have a, um, and you have a hunt unit that is only such so much of a size. And so you really just want to find your base camp and then you're actually traveling out from there. Whereas in Colorado, you know, it's a whole different deal, man, because you can go from one unit to another. You can drive friggin' 100 miles to another OTC unit, right? Yeah. So yeah. You, you really wow. need to be mobile there, you know, so that you yeah. can go to a different place if you're not finding something. But our mobility um, sometimes means even spiking out and having that something on our back where we use our hammocks and we use that or we use a small spike tent. Shoot, Chav and I used to spike out in an area that we hunted and in the morning we'd wake up and there were the elk out there feeding out in parks and stuff. Now, that takes us to the camping basics as far as where do you camp at so that it doesn't, so that you're not pissing in your own pot, right? And Yeah, yeah. That can be kind of critical, man. You got to place that camp where <clears throat> it's either between, like, um, I like to use like sometimes finger ridges and 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 camp in some of those areas where it's going to keep my scent inside. Or if we get wind, it's going to handle that a little differently. Or we're going to be in an area where, um, if we have a drainage that's draining away from the area that we want to be at hunting, we want to do that so our scent goes down from it. I just want to make sure I'm on the other side of my intended hunting area so that I'm not putting sound scent or anything like that in, in those areas. Um, even even if I'm doing a spike camp, you know, and, and I know that I have an area that I want to be, well, I want to kind of put that down a little bit from that area so that all my scent's going to fall away from my intended hunt area that's that's kind of basic on that it's pretty cool though when yeah. you put your camp up and you the bulls keep you up all night bugling and they oh, come yeah. along right through the middle of camp i mean when they're in mm. there when they're in their element man they're not caring where you're at no yeah, uh, I'm telling you they bugle all night and keep us up you know now so, that is if you're in a high use area right, right? Yeah. If you're in a high use yeah. area that they're always seeing and smelling humans, it's really not as as bad that you have to yeah. deal with like that, right? Yeah, well, no. Whoever yeah, wins I'm, a, I'm whoever wins that uh, that setup this year is really going to be mobile fast. So oh, oh my I'll, have to, I'll have to let you guys know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> Fernando Valenzuela. Hey, five by eight, baby. I want yeah. that. What's it gonna Man, be like? Too cool. What's it gonna be like when all eight of us are in there, though? Oh, that's all right. I'll share. Man. I'm good. All right. So I now, can tell you that. I, oh, go ahead, Gil. Go ahead, man. No, uh, what I was saying is, I think just what Joe said, 100, percent is picking out a good place where you can travel from. And look, I mean, this year in our in our uh, coach hunt. We traveled a long way from base camp to go hunt, man. Yeah. I mean, it, we'd go over two mountains and down into another or through a city. And I mean, on a side by side, we'd leave 45 minutes early every morning. And it'd been an hour and a half if we'd have went by a vehicle, you know. Uh, so we try, you know, we try to get our base camp in a real safe place and then hunt out of there, you know, and come back to it. I, I do understand. <laughs> the spike camp atmosphere uh more this year than any because of what i saw in areas that we were in right and it makes sense to do it when you're in some really tough areas much like where adam was right uh where yeah. adam killed his bull i mean as a as a booger bear to get up in there and a booger bear to get it out you know so when you're there you might as well just plant, you know put roots down and go hunt yeah, it's not going to be as comfortable as base camp, and the food's not right. going to be as hot and delicious. Right, right. You know, are you there? Yeah, I mean, you can go on vacation, go camping with the family another time, man. If you're there to kill elk, <laughs> put yourself in the best position to do it, right? So, yeah. I, the older I get, I though, the more I like that vacation camp, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like spike camps a lot. I've done it a lot, and I the advantage to me in my hunting area with a spike camp mm -hmm is the it, it's the issue of time time and travel so i'm right, right on top of them and then i'm getting more sleep because i'm not having to cover you know part of where i hunt i would have to actually hike out 
and be and sleep in a in a different hunting area than 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 mm-hmm. going then have to hike back into the wilderness. So spiking in there is yeah. like yeah, I get more sleep and uh and, and you're not sweating everything up the whole time you're going in, you get a chance to possibly hear something. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. So how so how far are you sleeping from the elk that you have picked out that you're gonna hunt? Uh, and then... I'm on top. I'm on top of them. I'm a, I'm a, it depends on where I'm. I usually set up two spike camps, so I have one up high. So I'm just waiting for them to come up in the morning, come back to their beds, and if, okay, depending, yeah. So I'm I'm right on top of them. Right. So, okay. Man, it's great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Where, and, and, and where he hunts elk are nomadic, man. They move. You know, right. they're constantly moving. Um, they come down. You know in the evening time they spend their time in that lower land and then as soon as those thermals start turning in the morning they head right back up to the top you know okay get out yeah. of the bugs get out of the heat uh get in the trees that are cooler and everything up top so we have a lot of movement up and down on those elk where eric and, so travis and we, yeah we'll put you in your element now man we're, <clears throat> we're getting to the calls and calling basics yeah baby right okay and, if if you had somebody that came in and said, you know, we don't want to daunt these guys. We want to make it as simple as possible, but make them effective, right? Yeah. What calls and what would be the calling basics that you would do, coach? For sure, basically start with just a single latex read, really light latex. You can bugle on it. You can cow call on it. You can do whatever you want on it. I got uh, just a single latex read right here my camera is uh-huh. that's all you want to look for just a single latex something really light you can see it's pretty pretty loose pretty light perfect and then basically i would just say you know if you've never called before if this is your tongue put the read on your tongue there and basically all you're doing is lifting the back part of your tongue and you're hissing like a snake to get sound so if you put that on your tongue raise it to the roof and just go that's the sound you're gonna get right so, so now I, I want you to do something travis i want you on there i want you to change yep. your your sound setting um up there to from uh to original sound on uh let's see how you get in here Oop. shit that didn't work Cause you kind of, we lost your high pitch there. So I want to make sure that we don't hear it. The sound of the background of the sounds. So if you go to sound settings, audio settings. Okay. So in audio settings, you'll see something in the audio profile that'll say, um, um, you'll see original sound for musicians. That gives you a chance to just to toggle between optimized auto and original sound. So, okay, is that is that under the three dots? Yeah. So, um, yeah. If you says, go, says more. Probably in that. Uh, that chat apps enable original sound. There you go. Enable original sound. Okay, let's try that. All right, let's see what that sounds like. There we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So when you put it on your tongue and you just hiss like a snake, that's the sound you're going to get. You still there, Joe? Yep. I got you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, from there, you basically, all you're going to do raise the back of your tongue and it feels like before you even put the reed in take your tongue and scrunch it up and touch your upper molars but keep the tip of your tongue down and then just literally hiss and you'll be like that's the air you're using it's coming out of your diaphragm it's a warm air it's a not air like you're whistling like that's a cold air the warm air when you're hissing is coming out of your diaphragm so from there, if you get that basic sound from the hissing, 
Now, if you start raising your tongue on the back, it's going to go higher and higher and higher. With the pressure to the latex. With the pressure, yeah, because you're putting pressure on the latex right here. You're putting your tongue is literally, let me hold this so you can see it. Your tongue is literally pushing on that latex. And as you push on the back part of this reed, that's what's pushing the latex up more and more and more. It's, and it's getting tighter and tighter. So what I like to teach people, as you're lifting your tongue, just do it really slow and you'll just find you're gonna get higher and higher. So. And don't worry about what it sounds like because when you first start, we all sound terrible. It's gonna cut out on you. You're gonna push too hard. You're not gonna push hard enough. Just try to get some basic sounds. And then from there, you learn that little siren like I just did. And that's your basics from all your cow sounds and all your bull sounds. So. And you can see when I do that, take a big breath in because you don't want to breathe. You don't want to run out of air, right? And basically, now if you take that siren sound, if you go all the way to the top and cut it off, you get a cow sound. Now, if you want a bugle, you just make it longer. Keep it really simple. Just keep it really long. So all you're doing is putting a growl at the end. So you're doing the exact same thing. It's just a longer cow sound, and then your bugle is a little bit longer. So, and then you can short, to get the shorter cow sound, you just start shortening it. Instead of going really long with it, just go up with it and down, up with it and down. So it ends up sounding like this. And what you're doing, what you're doing there at the end, you're actually, if I can show the latex again, you're actually putting pressure on it to get the high, and then you're dropping your tongue away from it at the very end. And that's what's giving you the yeah, yeah sound at the end. It's almost coming right off. And just do it really gentle and really slow. And I want people to notice when you're looking at Trav doing this, man, a lot of people will try to move their lips to make the sound there. Yeah. In order to make the sounds. And I want you to notice that he's not doing anything. If anything, it's just like a cow elk. They keep their mouth open. And then yeah. you can see his jaw just dropping as he's relaxing and coming off. Exactly. Of yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it sounds like with the reed ear. Yeah. So the 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 bull elk bugle and a cow, um, and a cow mew are yin and yang. One is going mm. up, one is coming down. It's almost just yeah. the opposite of each other, right? Yeah, exactly. That's why when you learn that siren, do it over and over till you're blue in the face. <laughs> And it sounds really, it sounds boring and it is going to be boring for you at first. But once you learn that, I'll tell you right now, you have a built in cow call and you have a built in bugle Absolutely. and it's really that simple. Just keep it that simple. So to get your bugle out of that, instead of coming back down and making the cow sound, <coughs> keep it going on the high side, keep the high pitch and then Throw your voice in through your through your through your throat. Literally go, Rah! and you can do it wimpy, Rah! or you can be like, Rah! whatever you want to do, right? Yeah. 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 
<sighs> so keep it simple like that and that's all with that siren they call it the siren going up and down mm -hmm. it, and, and that's, that's a great explanation it, it it teaches that Stop. control because elk calling is just all about air control yeah that and making those noises right yeah yeah and once you start learning the control you know like pretend you're a little kid and have fun with it Best don't I've worry about taught. that's so good dude yep yeah awesome. don't worry about making the exact perfect sound and right. all that like throw it around you know do some different stuff and eventually you're gonna start doing calf stuff you're gonna start doing cow stuff you're gonna try bugling i would say Try learning the cow stuff a little bit first and then move on to the bugles. But yes, with that the siren. Elk, elk calls I've ever heard came from elk. Yeah, <laughs> they do. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And you get one of those bulls that he's bugled out, you know, late September. He's like, yeah. <laughs> that's all he's got left. All right. So just a yeah, growler I've, bull. I've even heard him. Well, well, I think we actually talked about this, Travis, because you were talking about using one of those worn throat bugles that the bulls make. Yeah. You thought about doing mm -hmm. it in competition. You asked me, well, what do you think? And I was like, yeah, you know, you might just go right over the head of some of those judges with that. But yeah, I mean, I've been out there where they're just like, eh, <laughs> yeah. right. Absolutely. But the point I wanted to make here, though, that I want everybody to understand is basics. Call yeah. calling basics because really, honestly, if you can do a basic cow call, if you can yeah. do a basic bugle, you can do every sound that an elk makes, either yeah. by adding a little bit more tone or by adding some emotion or making it a different pitch or making something longer or shorter while you're yeah. at tone or voice or emotion. So, and, and, you know, you heard him when he talked about doing the voice at the end of it. I mean, it happens at the beginning of it. Yep. Uh, into it. And, you know, if it sounds like a bigger bull coming back yep. to that throat, you know, even cow, if you're going to do a insistent buzz type with a with a cow yeah. with a cow elk. Yeah. Now, we're not going to get into all this stuff, but what I right. just want you to understand is if you do these basics, yeah. basic call, you. you can do anything. You. Eric. Yeah, I think uh and Travis mentioned this on the last your guys last show. It's those uh, non threatening sounds too. It's the rakes, mm -hmm. the moans, yeah, the pant. Mm -hmm. Panting, Pant. those things, oh, man, Glunking. they work fantastic. Glunks, things like that. Those are so yep. simple. And, yeah. and let's keep Seriously. let's keep that basic. And and people are like, well, that's not a basic call. Let me tell you Whatever. what. The most basic call you can do is raking a tree. That yeah. is yeah. the most basic that you can do. And and, and yeah. pulling grass and pulling grass, raking yeah. a tree and ripping that yeah. grass. Oh man, that gets them. Stomping around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. these are sounds no, that I, really. I, go ahead. No, you you go ahead, Joe. Oh, I'm sorry. These are sounds that really anybody can do, and and very basic. When you talk about doing pants or huffs or grunts, when you talk about doing glunks, you know, basically just you know. And some people are like, "Well, does that work? Just in the tube? It doesn't sound." exactly like them let me yeah, tell man. you mm -hmm. it does work mm -hmm. and there's different things you can actually get different kinds of pipes that make a little bit better glunking noise when you do it um either yeah. whether you do it in the front or the back and people are like well that doesn't sound exactly like one of those i will tell you man it works you know oh, yeah. you have to sound it's different than the same old rodeo but as basic your basic cow call which now if you were going to make that that cow into a calf trap so basic to, way to do that basically to go to the calf sound it's a it's basically the cow sound without the yeah at the end you're just basically getting the yeah yeah so how i do that you're basically just pushing up on it and ending it you know what i mean you're not uh sorry dropped it there you you're not you're not yeah, 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 
You know what I mean? So when yep. you throw it in your mouth, you're basically going, so I'll do a cow. <coughs> Calf. So it's just like in a bull with the difference between a mature bull and a young bull you know, in the sound that you hear on the end of it. So remember that calf is young, yep. it's not dropping, it's not doing that little deeper voice, it doesn't have much control. It's real baby squeakish, right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. And it's... So Travis, if, if you had to hit the woods <clears throat> with one call in your pocket, right? Uh, obviously it'd be a Wapiti Rivers call, but at the end of the day, what would the call be? You know what I mean? Would it be a, a cow call? Would it be a calf call? Would it be a lost cow call? I mean, what would you, if you could only use one or teach somebody one to go out there and try to tackle what we do in calling elk, which one would it be, brother? Hands down, and and you need a tube for it, so you got to have a bugle tube. Hands down, it would be a chuckle okay. because a chuckle is an invite for bulls, calves, cows. That's the whole game plan. You're trying to call these beasts right to you. And a chuckle means, hey, I'm over here. Come on over and join me. <clears throat> so without getting into a chuckle, there's kind of two parts to a chuckle. It's, it's one of the hardest sounds to make and do properly. But it's basically you're making the, yeah sound with the reed <laughs> sucking in with your voice <laughs> so with the reed it's like this <laughs> and that's obviously exaggerating it but as you speed it up and get quicker with it and you add the tube it'll be like this and it really doesn't take a whole lot of them to put out there to yeah so exactly like when i really do it in the bush first off i'm doing the truck a really quiet so they can only hear like a hundred yards, maybe in front of me. So it'd be something. You know, really quiet. I don't want to just boom, explode the whole bush. Just get, get the elk that are right in front of you. And then if you don't get nothing, you know, wait 15, 20 minutes and do it a little bit louder, you know, and always those elk could be working into you. So always make sure you, you, you got your far. eyes eyes and ears open yeah near to far 100 percent. i tell you what i didn't i haven't used one as much but i'm telling you this year where we hunted it was a game changer when and not big chuckles it's the real light small chuckles that was mm -hmm. i mean a game changer for us oh, it, it sealed yeah. the deal twice when me and tom were hunting once when me and larry gill were together i called bulls back that went by us i called them back you know, and use that little bitty chuckle to get their attention, you know, yeah. and they wanted to, Oh man, where are you at? You know, I want yeah. to see where that is. It was so eye opening for me. And, uh, you know, I hear a lot of different, there's so many different ideas about elk calling, but that to mm -hmm. me this year, when we were in pressured elk was a big deal for us. So, yeah, I could see that. Cause what, how I think about elk calling, for me, it's an emotion, like 100% emotion. I mean, you can you can chuckle or you can bugle really nice and nonchalant, or you can be aggressive and just scream out there. It all means different things. Yes. So, I mean, that's the whole fun part of learning elk is playing with them, throwing different sounds at them. You know, when you call an elk and he, he's 50 yards away from you, most people just shut right up keep calling to him and keep playing with them and throw some calf sounds, throw some cow, chuckle at them, scream at them, just yeah. have fun, play the game with them. You don't know what he's going to do. And you're going to tell you, I learned so much from, from just doing that. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And, and not, not because of, 
anything other we don't get any money to talk about this at all but look there's a guy out there who's got an app out mr paul Medell, who's yep. got the elk, elk nut app and i'm telling you when you <clears throat> learn what those elk are saying it makes your calling even more effective because you yep. know what a roundup bugle is you know you know what a what a lost cow call is you know all of the different scenarios and then how to play into that so you know calling basics number one like you said trying to make a sound a cow sound a calf sound a bull sound but man understanding what they say i yeah. think may, maybe be more important than being able to make all of the internal sounds and together, the great thing right? about paul's app yeah. is, is something that you can have with you i mean we we have uh, we have the whole section on calling where we talk about scenarios and scenarios and the different types of calls and stuff. Great place for an education. I, I tell you guys, when it comes to calling elk and understanding elk, get every bit of information, information. And out there that you can. I mean, yeah. you know, Chris Rowe goes into depth and stuff out yes. there. You know, there's a lot of people that do things, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to give you the most basic. Simplify it. And yeah. yeah. And, I, and I'll just tell you this, a basic philosophy, yeah, a basic philosophy is absolutely, I'm always a lover before I'm a fighter, or even like what, you know, Travis is talking about there, even the bull, when he's starting out is being inviting, it's not being, yes. you know, it's not confrontation. challenging, being mm -hmm. confrontational. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there's a time and a place for that, and you'll know sure because is. that bull will yeah. tell you when there's a time. He'll place. take you but, there, yeah. 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 But, yeah. but as far as it goes in learning to talk and understand elk, get every bit. This is where we're going back to that mailbox question. Knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge. Yeah. knowledge. Because that's how you teach. Yeah. Right? So Yeah. Exactly. So in what in what Gilbert was saying there, the the one call I would take to the bush no matter what. Honestly, when you're when you're we have lots of time now, so start practicing now like grab some reads from whoever you like to buy reads from don't matter who it is find something that fits Wapiti you that's just yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> there you go find, find a single latex read don't that's super it. easy mm -hmm. and uh just start playing with it and now's the time like joe you mentioned earlier don't do it when you're on your way to elk camp like these things take a long time like it may look like it's easy to use that thing but <laughs> trust me it's not it takes a long time most of us have been playing with these for years and years and and still you know we and don't be scared of flubbing up the calls i mean dang man i i'm out there calling with the elk i flub up calls all the time it's mm -hmm. it don't there's no perfection in it you're in the elk woods be nasty and be natural and if you mess up a call just follow it up with another better one yeah. as simple as that the elk don't care and uh so yeah let's i will say one thing like all these calls have the dome on it you see the dome yep when i first started all the reeds didn't have domes yeah, they were so dome. you know they were just flat and nowadays all all the all the manufacturers have domes so yep. get one with the dome what it does the latex the latex only pushes so far if you push on the latex and I think if you can see that, yeah, it'll it'll bottom out on the bottom of that dome, right? So that's your that's basically your tongue putting the pressure on the latex. Well, it also if you keeps go to, that distance. It keeps that good distance from the roof of your mouth. Yeah, yeah. So yes, exactly. Yeah. So and then basically, if you do bottom it out, the noise stops because oh, yeah. you're you're vibrating this latex, yeah. and that's and what's you know making this sound. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So it kind of limits you to where you want to go. And literally, once you hit that high note, just back your tongue pressure off just a hair, and you can stay in that high note as long as you want. You know, till your air runs out, right? Sure. So, and that's just literally taking it up and then backing it up just a hair and then you got all kinds of control after that so cody, cody go ahead brother yeah I, I, i'd like to like to hear you talk about you know the 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 slits that you put in the back of that call um, oh okay you know, I, i'm gonna tell you one thing i have a, I, i've always had a problem with with gagging on on those calls and i've always had to trim them down 
Um, okay. This this year was was the first year I've used yours, and 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 that was a game changer for and me. You know, let me tell you something before he does, man. Is is it's the grinder? You know, the Elk Bros grinder there. That's the signature call that Travis makes for us. And the reason that Travis and I got to know each other was when I saw that call and I saw the cuts in there because I've always cut them out myself. I said, this is a guy that knows something about calls. Maida, I reached out to him and said, you know, we were talking for hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, literally. Yeah, I remember that. Joe, I have to cut every every diaphragm I've ever used except yours. Yeah. Except yours. Mm -hmm. I don't have to cut them. So how I came about with that. Dance right out of the package, Jack. That's perfect. Yeah. And what what it all is, is basically all the sides fold independently now. Yeah. So, and what happened is at the start, my dad had a really bad gag reflex. When you throw a read in, like 80% of us, you throw a read in, it's like, oh, oh man, that's not normal. Right? <laughs> that ain't no piece of bubble gum. So right. now having all the sides fold independently, we all have different shaped mouths. So it forms to your mouth, no matter what. I mean, you throw it in, and you pull it out and there's the shape of your mouth yeah. literally right there in the tape. Yeah. yeah. And that's like in seconds, you know, and you can see how much it, it bends. We're all a little bit different, right? Yeah. yeah whereas the other ones oh. that don't have the cuts will actually create a crimp in there and it doesn't let you get right. it. Yeah. That's where yeah. you see yeah. from, man. Yeah. Just a little bit of relief. And then the other thing that most people don't realize, it looks like a fang cut. But because it's Wapiti River Outdoors, it's That's actually a W, a d- a w for Wapiti. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's yeah. a W so. for WAP. It, it's for mm. us Italians, man. That's what it is, man. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> hey, yeah. guys, um, we're going we're gonna to close this out now. Um, we've already been going for a while here. And next time when we come back, if there's anything else we think about we need to do on call, and we will. But we're going to start on tactics, closing basics, shot placement. That's where we're going to do, go on the next time coming back. All right? Awesome. Yeah, look, it, uh, I don't know, guys. Got to thank Mr. Travis, man. He, world champion elk caller, builds his own elk calls. Having him on the podcast tonight to get you guys started off. I really feel my game changed. Number one, when I got my butt in shape and when I could call and make the sounds, elk hunting changed for me. I got to hunt with the great Joe Gillian, Leroy Chavez for many years and got tutored up by, by the, some of the best guys in the world, started making those sounds and sounding like them. And uh, before you know it, I was calling bulls in for them and uh, calling elk in for other people. And I'm telling you, I absolutely love doing it. We, you got to learn how to make a sound. I think it's one of the most important things when you hit the woods. Yes, we need to know hunt basics, scouting basics. Do yep. what, what, brother? It's the game changer right there. It it really is the game changer Mm -hmm. when you understand what they're saying and you can speak the language. It is a total game changer. Invest in yourselves. Invest in your time to get better at doing those things. And these basic things will carry you a long way. Get after our base camp, man. It's going to be awesome. We got our hunt giveaway coming up, man. It's been an awesome podcast. Can't thank all everybody for coming tuning in tonight and mondo and his gracious giveaways man so awesome to be part of what the bow hitch has got going on guys if you like what we're doing please subscribe rate and review us you got to go to apple podcast or itunes to review us and you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com and a reminder to all our listeners if you'd like your question answered on our show just send your question to info at elkbros.com Com. That's I-N-F-O at elkbros.com. And like we say down here in the Lone Star State, husbands, kiss your wives. Wives, kiss your husbands. Hug your babies. Keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry. And we'll see you next week right here on Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, yeah, fellas. boys. Hey, mm-hmm. And job. for all our listeners, we got a little bit of Tony Wintrip's music to help us close out the show. Peace, peace. Awesome. Good show. See you guys. Had a wall down a deep draw surrounded by some brush. And every time I'd see the white tips get the Rocky Mountain rush. A constant swing of thermals had him sniffing up the wind. 
As the blood and sweat and tears of mine came rolling down my chin. I saw a monster with no shots to take. Points on top like a garden rake. Tracks as big as a Clydesdale on the run. And he talked trash to me while he ran away. And I'll be back to ruin his day. When the elk gods come to call on malicious. And the temperatures start to drop. So I packed up, ready to make my way up on the mountaintop. With a quiver full of six and three blades sharp and ready. My heart was maxed out and all I had to do was hold her steady. Delicious was a man above a man. When he left the thunder roll, you could hear him all across the land. Flash of mud, and he weighed more than a grand. Now it's him and I in Timberline, and he's down to his last stand. Malicious is in my 